Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchins. Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and I'm heading out to Southern California, Orange County, Orange, California area. I'm going to speak with Spencer Kirksey. Now, Spencer is an AD, he's a teacher coach, and uh, he builds character in young men and, and young women. So, Spencer, um, I'm so excited to talk to a hunter from Southern California. Brucey, my man, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, it's exciting, and, you know, I think in the days that uh, I lived in Southern California and worked up in San Jose, and and I had a great time there, and I was also in the Coast Guard. I was stationed in San Diego, so uh, I know plenty about the Southern California lifestyle, and uh, it, it's quite something. But one thing that quite something doesn't fit is is hunting in, in Southern California or hunting in California any, anywhere. Let's talk about that. How, how did you you know, become a hunter living in Southern California. Well, yeah, you uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Uh, hunting in Southern California are two things that usually don't hear together. Uh, but so uh, pretty much, you know, where I grew up, I grew up in Topanga Canyon, which is a, a little small town city uh, out just, uh, just south of Malibu. Um, and it was pretty, pretty country as you could get um, while still living in Southern California. We were tucked away in between. And uh, we had a big old creek running down it. Um, and, uh, I mean, I just grew up running up and down that creek bed and uh, getting in some trouble, exploring adventures, uh, growing up all throughout my youth. Uh, so I really grew up uh, just really run, running those mountains and creeks and living that outside lifestyle at a really, really young age. But, um, uh, you know, like we alluded to before, you know, Southern California hunting don't really mix very well. So, uh how I really started to get into the hunting um, lifestyle was uh, my family through uh, through Texas. I've got fam- got a lot of family out in like the Round Rock, Texas area, and uh, every year we would go out, um, you know, a week or so. Uh, it was usually around Thanksgiving uh, time, and uh, we would go plan a couple hunts, and um, that's kind of how I started to get that uh, uh, that. That, that need and want for it and I, and I realized that this is something that I really really like uh, but uh, you know that was very part time because it was really only once a year uh, and it was very seasonal for me um, you know once I was out of Texas it was kind of out of sight out of mind but uh, now that I've gotten older and I've, I've done playing baseball I used to be a college level athlete and uh, once, I, once I got out of all that I started to uh, get a chance to kind of revive that passion for the outdoors and um, and that, and you know, that's kind of how we're, that's where we are now. You know, that's, that's how I got to be where I am right now is, is all of that leading up to this moment. Wow. That's, you know, that's interesting. I know, um, I used to surf up by Malibu and, and I surf once or twice to Panion Canyon where, where the Creek comes out and there's a sandbar yeah. there and, and stuff. And so a lot of people, um, surf there and, and I was surfing there early enough in the seventies. It wasn't territorial as it is today. Uh, it's just interesting. People have their home breaks, and that's their home break. So get out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Locals only. <laughs> uh, that's kind of way, kind of way it is. Um, and I was pretty good, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting anybody's way. But anyway, that's it. it, it talking to you brings back so many great memories of of, okay. of living out there. And, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it really is. And so, you know, um, where'd you go to school? Where'd you go to college? Uh. So we went to Pacific Palisades High School. That's where I played uh, three years varsity baseball. Um, had a great time growing up out there. Um, and then I ended up going to um, two local junior colleges right out uh, to play baseball. One was Pierce College. Uh, played there for, uh, well, I redshirted and played there for a year. And then I went to uh, Oxnard College to finish up my junior college experience for baseball. And then I went out to a school in Missouri. Um, and uh, that was a small NAI school uh, called Culver Stockton College. I played there. Um, and then, uh, I, oddly enough, 
came home, wasn't enjoying the Missouri experience. Um, imagine that, a Southern California boy in Missouri not enjoying themselves. But um, it, uh, it brought me back home. I played a little. It was, it was labeled as uh, semi-professional baseball. I played about a, a half a season, and uh, I just kind of hung them up. And uh, right out of that, um, I started my coaching career. Uh, and I've been coaching for man uh, ten plus years now. Um, it's uh, it's been an amazing, rewarding experience. Um, lots of ups, lots of downs. You really, I really, it's funny. I really toward, I gravitate towards the kid, uh, you know, who would be labeled as a misfit. You know what I mean? Or the kid that uh, has idle hands and needs something to do, and is just looking for that channel or avenue to um, to put forth all that energy. And uh, I really, I really kind of gravitate, gravitate towards kids like that. So, um, so that's kind of how it all started with me. I came home, retired from baseball, went back to college, started getting my degrees. I've got a, a bachelor's of science in kinesiology and I've got a master's in athletic administration now. Um, so, you know, uh, that's, that's how it kind of all started um, with the coaching world for me. And now I'm a PE teacher in Southern California and athletic director and, I uh, I coach I still coach baseball and um, I coach flag football when I'm a kid. Uh, you know I just uh, I enjoy being around athletics because you know at the end of the day you're gonna learn a lot um, about yourself, about others, and about life through athletics. And I think we can all agree on that. Um, it's just a really really important part in of, of life that um, you need to go through. And it doesn't mean you have to become a professional athlete, but uh, there are so many life lessons to be learned uh, through not only athletics, but also being outdoors as well. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, and you, you talk about that. I remember in my past, um, there were some coaches I would play for and other coaches I wouldn't. And um, the ones that I would play for, I excelled. The other ones, I just, that's why I left college football because I just didn't want to play for the coach. We just didn't click and it wasn't. As they say today, it, it wasn't a fit, and um, so I ran track all four years in, in uh, Division Three, and and that was that. But I, I get that. And some of the best uh, life lessons I ever learned was on the field of competition, and 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 what the coaches shared with me. So, you know, um, you do build, and you have a huge impact on the character and the future lives of kids. Those that want to accept it, those that don't. Um, well, we know they all go to, uh, you know, someplace else. Yep. That's right. That's right. You can leave the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just really amazing, amazing thing when you see, um, the impact, uh, people like you have, uh, on, uh, you know, on kids. So, you know, uh, you know, props to you. That's, that's for, that's for certain. I you know, I, I always think back, and I, if you talk to anybody who is in the world of athletics uh, as an athlete, at, at some point in their life, there are always there's always that one, at least one coach that they cross paths with uh, that made a difference in their life. You know, you, hopefully for the better. Um, but I know there's always been at least one or two coaches that I've you know crossed paths with that you know I hang on to um, knowledge life lessons that they've given me to this day yeah that's you know i i think that's great and the same thing with mentoring switching it back to the hunting community the same thing that people mentor i remember Otto knight and and harry shear um they were my two you know mentors um you know for hunting and yeah. um you know i remember them today and there isn't a time that people start talking about mentorship and, and, and getting me out there or, or wanting me to get out there. And, you know, those two guys don't come up. And so, you know, and that's what we need more of in the outdoor sports today is Absolutely, more yeah. mentors. And it's not just, it's not, not the shooting sports uh, or archery or it, it's, it's all sports, just getting kids outdoors. Cause as you see it, everybody get their heads stuck in their, Palm Pilot or a smartphone or, or whatever it is, and it's a changing environment. You know, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Technology is a great thing, uh, but it also could be pretty catastrophic. And um, just 
you know, just taking the time to get outside and just whether it's, you know, you don't have to have a bow in your hand. You don't have to have a rifle in your hand. Uh, you can go out and go on a walk. You know, one of my favorite things to do out in the mountains uh, when it's not hunting season is just go up as far as I can, um, find one of the steepest mountains I can, uh, embrace the suck. You know, I think that's one of the big things that people get away from is the, the thought of failure and the, the, uh, the thought of, oh, man, this is going to suck a lot. I don't want any part of that. But that's when you find yourself. It really is. And, and uh, one of the things I love to do is go up that steep mountain like I said, embrace the suck and just sit there and just listen. And, and, uh, you know, I, I always loved the, uh, the saying, the sweet sound of nothing, you know, um, when there's so much busy, so much busyness going on, uh, in our world with, you know, traffic and cars and people and commuting and, um, whatever, you know, plug in whatever you want, but, you know, to be on the top of the mountain and it is so quiet that you can hear a bird's wings flapping through the air. That's where I want to be. And I love, I, I try to do that at least, you know, hunting season, I'm, I'm doing it two, three times a week. But when it's not, I'm, I'm trying to get up there as much as I can. It is really reviving for the soul to be up there and, and just, you know, it is okay not to be doing something. You know what I mean? Like just being up on that mountain and uh, just in, embracing and enjoying what Mother Nature has given us. And, um, and, and, and that's one of my, that's, that's one of my favorite times honest is just being up there and with nothing to do yeah it reminds me of yesterday's um sunrise in um central nebraska and i got up early and i was gonna get get up high on the on the ridges and stuff and, and look for mule deer and um you know sun came up and i just kind of you know took my pack off kicked back and just watched the whole thing unfold and the birds you know you could hear the cows moving from a mile away it seemed they weren't a mile away but it seemed they were a mile away yeah and it's just it, it's a it's a beautiful thing, um, and you know, uh, thank you for sharing that. The, that's no, no. you know that's that's the wilderness experience that we all, um, and you can be in wilderness, folks, pretty close to L.A. Actually, you oh can yeah, get... I mean everyone thinks L.A. You know, big buildings and and freeways and all that, but you don't have to go too far to go find some mountains and get away from everything. It's uh, I mean, it, it's not as easy as, you know, Montana or Colorado, a state like that. But, um, you know, we've got some pretty amazing mountains out here in Southern California. Now, are you um, a longbow hunter or traditional hunter, or do you hunt with a compound? Uh, I hunt with a, comp a compound. Um, I don't like to miss that often. No, I'm just kidding. Strad <laughs> uh, bow is awesome. Those, those things are awesome. I love messing around with those things. Um, uh you don't you can't get any more primal than that in my in my opinion is uh is running a longbow or a strad bow but um uh I, my first introduction was with a compound bow and that's uh what i stick to when i'm uh when i'm out in the field and, and actually hunting now uh share your hunting experience i think you had a, a grip and grin you had a picture up and i think that's what attracted me to you know invite you on the show yeah so you know uh, and the, the whole term grip and grin, you know, I, uh, I, I am not a, I, I don't, it's not my style. I'll say it that way. It's not my style. I, I, um, I, I take, I, I, you know, you've seen my photos. I try to bring some artistic, um, or artisticness, I guess, through my photos and photography and trying to connect that way with my Instagram content. But, um, uh, you know, I, I was really, really lucky, uh, this year. I, uh, this is again. This is only my second year truly bow hunting, um, and uh, it's it's been quite the experience. And just like we alluded to earlier, like there's so many things I've learned just in just in the matter of months um, uh, with the with the great outdoors. And um, so we, we've been kind of sitting on this one spot. We've been really liking the footage from our cameras we like. And, uh, we hunted there a few times with you know coming up with goose eggs and. Um, we did an overnight stay, uh, slept in the back of the truck in the old school, and got an early start. Uh, we, we really liked what we were seeing. Uh, went to full draw on a couple times, uh, but just wasn't presented with an ethical shot um, on a few different deer. And um, uh, as the morning grew older, uh, the sun was really starting to peak, and I was you know, really starting to think like, well, 
shoot, I think this might be it, you know. Um, might have to start thinking about packing it in. And just as I thought that, um, I saw two young bucks come up on my right side, um, I mean, out of nowhere. And um, and one, and it all happened so fast as it usually does. Uh, they came perfectly broadside. Uh, I picked the legal one. And um, he was, I mean, he couldn't be more than 20 yards away from me, had no clue I was there, um, and uh, put it right through his lungs. It was, uh, it was a great shot. He was, he, was, uh, he was gone in 10 seconds. I saw him sprint up the side of the hillside behind some brush right, right in front of me, um, and I gave it about 45 minutes, walked up, retrieved the arrow, saw some good blood, and uh, went around the bend right, right where I lost sight of him, and there he was. You know, so you can't really ask for any more than that. You know, a, a great ethical, clean shot, and uh, try to make it as painless as possible. And uh, and that's what I did. It was a great, great day. Oh man, I'll never. I truly will never forget that moment. It was it was such an amazing experience. So um, one, you were on the ground, correct? And, and... absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I uh, I was. Uh, it was really just me embedding myself in nature. There was a big downed tree uh, that was at the bottom of kind of a little knoll and I uh I kind of tucked myself away behind in there there was a little bit of brush and this big down tree and I mean it was a big down tree uh and I kind of just you know I was literally just standing behind it and um and the guy just popped up right in front of me it was uh it was it was quite quite amazing I it couldn't have gone any better now how do you put yourself in the right spot obviously in the whole mountainside or hillside you were yeah. in the right spot. How did that happen? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you pick up things. Uh, you kind of look at shooting lanes. And, um, you know, like, uh, I, for me, I found this one spot. I was like, all right, well, my back's covered. I'm, I, I, I'm in some shadows. Because, um, you know, when bow hunting or hunting in general, you try not to have a silhouette of yourself. So I put my back up against something. And, and it just happened to be where I was. Um, I had a really big shooting window, um, and uh, and that's kind of where my thought process was. So I, you know, I wanted to stay back in the shade, wanted to get my back up against something, so I didn't have a silhouette, um, and gave myself multiple shooting uh, lanes, and and that's what I did. But how did you know there was game around? Uh, so I had been I had been scouting that area for quite some time, and uh, I've been hanging some cameras uh, here and there, and been really liking the activity that I saw there and uh, I decided to make it my uh, my number one spot um, it was quite a drive so I only had to go up there a few times but um, we had the holy fire out here in Orange County and uh, obviously I would love to be able to hunt 30 minutes away or 20 minutes away uh, but since the holy fire hit and just poured acres and acres of land out here uh, they had shut down all access a lot of the areas I've been scouting, um, and so my this or this area became my <laughs> my golden goose. I had I had to get something out of there because I really didn't have any other options. So how many hours did you have to drive? Oh, uh, it was solid three hours, solid three, I would say. Um, and then the uh, and, and where we ended up, uh, you know, putting putting our blind down, uh, it it was straight downhill. Uh, which was great getting there, but uh, you know, in the back of my man, mind, you know, I'm thinking, oh man, when I pull something out out here, or if and when I pull something out here, this pack out is going to be one hell of a tough time, and it did not disappoint, that's for sure. But uh, it was, uh, you know, it was so well worth it. I mean, the the, the full freezer I have right now, um, and just the the experiences and just. You know the overall adventure uh, of that of that weekend um, was worth it tenfold to me. So, did you go with a couple of buddies? Just with it, just with one buddy. Uh, his name's Eric. I always give him crap for being redhead, even though I have redhead. I'm I have red hair as well. Uh, but uh, he he uh, he and I met uh, almost around the same time, um, and uh, we were at a local indoor archery range. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he literally, I probably, I probably had a bow in my hand maybe two months before he did. So I was, I mean, just as green around the ears as he was. And, 
Uh, I saw him come in. He had literally just bought a bow, uh, and I just saw the deer in headlights look with him. He had no idea what he was doing. The, the guy's kind of like, all right, here's your bow. Good luck. And they just kind of dropped it off with him, and he was, like, sitting there in the lion's den, like, not a clue what's going on. And so I kind of saw that look in his eyes, and I just kind of walked up to him. and was like, hey, bud, like, first day? <laughs> And uh, he was like, yeah, man, I got, I got no clue what I'm doing. And so, you know, again, this is coming from a complete rookie as well. But, you know, I knew a little bit more than he did. So I just tried to help him out and, um, and give him as much information that I had. and You know, tell him the things that, hey, whatever you do, don't do this. Or, you know, there, these are the things that really work for me. Um, so I just tried to give him as much information as I could. Uh, and we ha- we actually became great friends. I was in his wedding just just recently, just a couple months past, and um, he's actually going to be in my wedding. I'm getting married in a month, uh, literally a month. Uh, so uh, you know, it's it's funny the relationships that happen over hunting. You know, just two random guys in a uh, in an indoor archery range. Wow, what a what a beautiful story. That's that's <laughs> that's, that's way cool. Now um, these are uh, black tailed deer. Uh, yeah. It's been described to me as kind of a hybrid between a, a mule deer and a black tail, uh, but I would definitely go more towards a black tail if I were to have to pick one or the other. Definitely not a straight mule deer. And what do they weigh? 150 pounds? 200 pounds? Uh, 100 pounds? I, I, it all depends. I think mine was around, around uh, I should say, like 160, 170. It was probably around 170. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's going to all depend. But, yeah, they're not huge. You're not pulling, you know, a 240 thing out of there. That's not. That's not going to happen. Yeah, but that's still. That's still a lot of meat. I mean, you oh, bone that yeah. out, and you yeah. got a lot of meat. I, I'm good. I still got another deer tag that I'm going to be looking to fill this weekend. But uh, uh, yeah, no, it's definitely a lot of meat. That's there's no doubt about that. And, and I'm using everything, man. I'm using absolutely everything. I'm even using the bones for bone broth. I'm trying to use as much as I can out of everything. Yeah, I've got a friend uh, who has a podcast, Living Country in the City, Sam Ayers, and he works literally and lives in Hollywood. That's that's where he handles them, and um, just a great young guy. And and so I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce you two guys because I I'm think you you get together. Plus, you'd be a great guest on the show. Oh man, I would I would love that. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm making a note. I'm making a note right now to do that. You know, when you think about all the things you had to do to get to you to be able to you know, uh, let that arrow go and ha- make your first harvest. You know, it, it, it's an incredible journey. What are the two or three things that you've learned out of that that you'd like to share with uh, the listeners? Oh, man. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> Patience. There's If there's one thing, and trust me, I was never good at that. Um, I, uh, I was always the kind of here and now, let's do this right now kind of guy. Uh, but uh, hunting has taught me one thing, and that is patience. Because you, I, I was before I had that first harvest, I was sitting there for three hours, three hours with with nothing, you know. Um, but if you're a person who's going to come into this kind of space and think that you know if it's not a success unless I'm pulling something out, it's going to be a long day. It's going to be a long year, um, and you're probably going to end up quitting. You're probably going to end up selling your bow, selling your hunting gear, and taking up something else like golf or something because it's uh, it's not for the faint of heart, and um, and it's it's not for the person who needs something right then and there. Um, it's it's the it's the slow burn, it's the long marathon that um, that has taught me a lot. Um, but if there's one thing I can drive home right now, is it, it's it's patience. But uh, and. The whole thing about you know being success is your is the whole success thing. Hunting, and I'm stealing this quote from somebody. Hunting is the pursuit of something. Okay, so as long as you are out there enjoying yourself, pursuing something, you're being a successful hunter. Okay, uh, and like I said, if if you're only measuring your success by you know the size of the rack or you pulling something out of there, you're missing the point. You really are. It, it's a successful hunt to me is being out in the great outdoors and enjoying yourself and the experiences and the relationships that you make uh, with not only people, but, you know, Mother Nature and, and just breathing it all, in, taking it all in. Um, it's, uh, it, that's, 
the biggest thing that I, I want people to understand is, is, you know, success is not just the size of the rack or, or pulling something out of that fourth. You know, it's, it's really the, the overall experience of just being out there and doing one of the hardest things to do, literally. Like, hunting is one of the hardest things I've ever tried to do in my life. And a lot of people can, I think that resonates with, um, is because it is, it's just the amount of time it takes to be successful. And you can put in those hours and those days and those everything, those blood, the blood, sweat, and tears. You can put all those things into it and still be coming home empty, okay? Well, you know, the, the, you know, the quote coming up empty, but that's not me. Like, I'm never coming home empty because I'm always going to be that person to have that mindset of, man, that was an awesome experience. My first, my first bow hunt ever, I went out to Arizona, and uh, I was with my future father-in-law and uh, future brother-in-laws. And, uh, you know, when, Ari- when you say the word Arizona, Rain usually doesn't come to mind, but as uh, luck would have it, we got rained out for four freaking days. Oh, no. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And and again, rain in Arizona, it's like hunting in Southern California. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, But we got completely rained out, just some of the worst weather you've ever seen in your life for definitely Arizona. Um, And we were out there hunting javelina. And it was just a complete goose egg, absolute goose egg. But I, I walked out and I remember the day, the moment, the moment I was like, all right, well, the hunt's over. I'm, I'm starting my descent. Uh, I'm going back to camp and, you know, we're going to have a couple beers and, you know, get the campfire going and then we're going to leave in the morning and that's going to be that. Uh, and I was okay with that because all of these, those, these experiences, um, and and just the journey of everything, like getting close, thinking we're close to a javelina, and that thing just takes off on us. You know, just one of the just those kind of things. But I don't want people to think like, oh man, that was a waste of time. Because if that's your mindset, then dude, do something else. Because it's not this. It's going to be rough for you. Because you need to have that mindset of just enjoy the moment, be there in the moment. And if you pull something out of the forest, you know, you punch a tag. Good, awesome, congratulations! But don't measure all of your success on that one moment because they're, you're missing out on so many other moments. Well said. Well <laughs> said. I, I, was, I was rambling a little bit, but I mean, no, I, no, that's perfect that's because like, because it's the journey. Yeah, it's and, the journey. You know, it's just a journey, and and I was um, found a place to hunt, and so I had never hunted there before, and and cruised on over there, and and met so many great people neat people fun people to just talk with in this little small community in central uh nebraska this past week and um you know it was only up there four days or whatever i was up there and um but it's a journey because now i've got memories of, of discussions um uh, with folks that have been on the same land for four generations i mean that's huge you yeah, know and, awesome. you know that's huge and you know i i never I never um, pulled the trigger on my crossbow, but that was okay, yeah. you know, because, you know, just the people I met. So perhaps you well said, I really yeah, like how pull, you, how you yeah, said that. Pulling, pulling the trigger or releasing your bow or, you know, whatever you want to plug in there, like that is just such a small part of it. It really, really is. The All the other experiences of being able to kind of, you know, connect with the great outdoors and your friends and your family, like that, to me, that is, that is what you need to take away from from hunting, not just pulling things out. And that's what we're going to share with the, the people that don't understand hunting. Now, anti hunters, they're 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 pretty much set in stone, and they're going to stay that way unless Aren't they fun you to know. Talk to? <laughs> yeah, it's really fun to talk to them. Yeah. You know, and and there's some people that are so just abhor me harvesting game that it's yeah. it's nuts. But there's there's a ground. Of people that they're really not any hunters, they're they're not for or against hunting. They just never had a conversation like you just shared, and um, the experience and look at the relationship you developed with your with your with your buddy now, and um, heck, you're in each other's wedding. So yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely, absolutely, that happened because of hunting. 
yes, but it, it it's just part of the lifestyle that we live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with the whole and with the whole Instagram thing, you know, like I have met so many amazing people through this Instagram. I mean, whatever you want to call it, we'll call it an Instagram journey. But I've met so many cool people from all over the world, literally all over the world, uh, that I have great conversations with. We get to bounce ideas off of each other, uh, different concepts and opinions, uh, different hunting styles, uh, different uh, different scouting styles. I mean, you name it. And this is all, and it's all around hunting. It's all around all of our mutual passions for the great outdoors and just, just being out there in nature and, and just enjoying everything. And I wish people could have those conversations with people like us to show them, like, we're not just <laughs> crazed murderers out there just shooting anything that moves. And, you know, it, it's it's crazy to me that, that that's an actual uh, thought that happens or in, occurs in people's minds about us. Because, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are people out there that hunt and don't do us any justice. Um, and you'll find that with any, I would say, hobby or profession. There is always going to be somebody who doesn't put uh, your passion in the best light. That is just part of life. You know, not everyone's going to get along. Not everyone's going to agree. And not everyone's going to play by the rules. Um, and, but that's just something everyone has to deal with and, and, uh, and know that it's a thing and just move on from it and just keep doing the right thing. Um, and I, you know, I was actually showing a, a video um, to a coworker not that long ago. Um, and it was, uh, it was, his name is er, uh, Eduardo Garcia. And uh, he's a world famous um, uh, chef, uh, wild game chef. Uh, and uh, he does these, uh, he does these little uh, short films with, uh, with Yeti. Uh, they are called The Hungry Life. And, and, you know, they range from eight to 12 minutes long. And they are just mesmerizing because he literally will go out to anywhere and pull, start start gathering things from the terrain. He'll go out and throw a fishing line out and pull out some trout. Or he'll go, you know, he had an episode out in uh, in, uh, in Hawaii where he was able to harvest uh, uh, an active deer with his bow. And then literally right then and there, they build a campfire and he makes this amazing meal out of everything. And I showed that video and I showed multiple videos to this person I work with who's not necessarily against hunting, but, you know, is just so foreign to her. Uh, and I showed her this video. She's like, oh, my goodness. Like, I, I had no idea, like, people like that exist. And, like, you can, you can do those things. Uh, and, I, and I was trying to show her, like, like, this is what it's about, like, connecting with your food and connecting, uh, you know, with, with nature and everything. And that's, that's something that. I really am trying to drive home with these people that, um, you know, have have really no idea like what it should be about and what it really is about. Yeah, I, I like that. And there's a lot of tools we can use, folks. So, you know, um, this honey season, you know, good luck to everybody. But when you start thinking about telling your story after the hunt, use some great examples with people and just get them engaged because you never know, um, you know, what impact you'll have on, on somebody else's life that, you know, is, let's just say is neutral to the concept of hunting. They're neutral because nobody's ever explained them. Nobody's ever taken them. And they, they don't know the experiences of sitting on mountaintops or sitting in a slough. It doesn't matter. Just being out in nature is a wonderful thing. You know, yeah, it just, absolutely. it's just, a, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah. And, and they don't get that chance. You know, like you said, like they just don't know any better. Um, and if, you know, if people like us can make a positive splash in, in those people's lives and, and show them what hunting is really about, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's the ultimate goal in my mind is, is, to, is to help people understand what hunting is really all about. Um, there, it's, it'll always be me connecting with nature. Um, I think that's the most intimate way to connect with nature. Um, but again, <laughs> the meat. Let's talk about the meat. Like for me, that is the that's the trophy for me. Like being able to provide for my friends and family and for myself this pure organic can't get any more organic meat, and being able to be there the moment I harvest it to all of the hard work that goes through processing everything and being able to do that with my own two hands 
knowing where my where my food is coming from, literally, like I know exactly where it came from because I pulled it out of the forest myself, and then I process all of it myself, and then be able to package and label and put it in my freezer, and then take it out and have a barbecue with my friends and family. Like, like what is wrong with that? Absolutely nothing is the answer. You know that that is something that I take great great pride in to be able to provide, and um, and I want people to be able to see that. And I want people able to understand that they can do that. Well said. I mean, I'm just I'm sitting here saying, man, I could use this guy. You know, we, we should do an infomercial. We should put a <laughs> video together. No, in all seriousness, because as a as as a young hunter, um, you're very very mature in what hunting is and and what it isn't. Um, yeah. You've touched on so many things today, and I just want to thank you for being a guest on oh. Whitetail Rendezvous and, and sharing that. And I, and I will get you know props to Sam Air Living Country in in the city. Uh, Sam Airs, I will get you guys. Uh, you know, I'll send an email where it goes. I have no idea, but um, you know, he's he's an amazing young man uh, as as you are, uh, Spencer. Oh, I, I would I would love I would love to hook up. That'd be great. So, any final thoughts before we uh, close out this segment of Whitetail Rendezvous? Any final thoughts? Um, you know what? Enjoy it. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the experience. Enjoy. Embrace the suck. Embrace the good times. Embrace the bad times. Because at the end of the day, those are the experiences that are going to make you who you are. And, um, uh, you know, that's what it's really about. That's what it really, really is about. Enjoying life and um, and trying to positive positively influence other people and that's those are my final thoughts Bruce boy that's all i got for you oh <laughs> uh, well you know you're the type of coach i'd i'd, I'd go through the wall i mean <laughs> uh, i appreciate that sir i appreciate that oh yeah you're, you're the type of guy that you know um in my mind it, it's got it pretty much figured out where i live and um you know who wouldn't want to play you know or or learn from a person like that um yeah. And the kids that don't, you know, that's the hardest part, I think, in your business. The kids that don't, you got to let them go. Um, yeah, yeah, no, and it's sad because eventually you do hit a, po- a point where you're like, you know what, this, this just uh, isn't working out. You know, you if you don't if you don't want to be helped, you know, I can't keep breaking my back. You know what I mean? Because there's so many other people that need it. Well, they're looking for it. They're just waiting for you to show up, like that yep. guy with deer in the headlights. Yep, exactly, exactly. I'll tell. I'll make. That uh, I tell him that Bruce said that I'm your uh, your savior. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know I'd love to have him on the podcast too. So. Absolutely, he would love that. He's a good. He's a, he's a very very solid guy. Very solid guy. Great. Great guy. Well, you you um you just send my email address. Say hey, I was just on the podcast with Bruce, and uh, you're up next, buddy. Uh, sounds good. I'll I'll make sure that happens. What's his name? His name is Eric Anderson. Eric Anderson. Okay. Yep. yep. All right. Well, buddy, I got to go and I got to get ready for my next show, but uh, we'll be in touch. And, um, you know, um, I don't know the next time I'm going to be out in in Southern California, but when I am, we'll we'll meet at uh, Duke's uh, in Huntington Beach and have a beer. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that day, Bruce. Thanks a lot for having me, man. Okay, man. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.